Hello, fellow human. I'm Human Pruitt, and this is Human Gem. And today on WebDM, human music. We like it. So Jim Davis, what is it to be what the Ferengi call human? Human show. The we're human show. A, we're doing a human show. Yeah, I mean, we are humans. <laughs> right. So to speak. Presumably. Presumably, yes. assuming, assuming that we aren't all figments of some... Uh, right, assuming that we're not all figments of a simulated some. reality of an alien intelligence that's, uh, that yeah. could end it at any moment because they didn't like the save game and they're going to... Humans in Dungeons and Dragons are... Yeah, they are obviously the baseline assumption. Kind of the touchstone for everyone. And, and for a lot of players, it seems like human is their go-to the race when they're making characters they they seem to be you know very popular there was that article on 538 about yeah. like what character how rare is your character class yeah yeah, yeah. and it, i was surprised to see humans at the top i would have thought it'd be something else it seems like you know elves, like or, elves or tieflings or, or dwarves or dragonborn or something more some of the more exotic kind of races and i, I think that's a testament to the fact that there are role players who just do this once a week and they play the game and they don't really think about it afterwards. They mm -hmm. they may or may not buy a book. They may or may not buy their own dice bags, but right. they're having fun in that moment. And yeah. then there are those gamers who uh, read online. They're on Twitter. They're on Reddit. They're on the forums. They're on YouTube, right? And those people have a dedication and a uh, a desire for to get more out of the game than yeah. just the casual player. And to step step outside their normal bounds of, of of comfortability. Right, and so I think that that skews the conversations around role playing games because it's those people who are the most dedicated who tend to be having that conversation and thinking like, well, I, this is kind of how I see the end of third edition going down, which was like a very vocal group of passionate people were like, here are the flaws in third edition. We've got to fix them. This is unacceptable. Et cetera, et cetera, and then they listened to those few people and created fourth edition for them, and mm -hmm. then it, it didn't maybe go over so well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I kind of see that maybe with the the races that are they're playing. I, in my mind, it's like, man, nobody's playing humans. Humans are the boring one. Everybody right. wants something new and fresh and different, and they want this thing and whatever the new race is that's coming out. Yeah. Where clearly that's maybe not the case, right? Yeah. And and humans are both the baseline and perhaps one of the most popular races uh, for people to uh, to play characters. And so it's worthwhile talking about, even though it's like people might see the title of the video <laughs> and say like, humans. what are you going to talk about for humans? Well, guess what? Where's my camera? We're going to show you. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to start with the first and usually the ending question, mm -hmm. why aren't you playing a variant human? Uh, well, number one, because you might not be allowed. It might be off limits because there are no feats allowed in a game, yeah. and so therefore variant humans off limits. Uh, and, and second off, even if you're playing in a game with feats, you might have a particular type of character that's very stat heavy. Yes. And you might want that plus one to everything. There Every are some, single one. Right, like there's some gish builds where you want your attack stat, your con, and your casting stat. And mm -hmm. having three stats that you want as high as possible. Yeah, that's mad AF. Every little bit helps. And yeah. so having a, a plus one to everything is gonna be a benefit for that. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of why. If you have a stat heavy build, then you might wanna go with the baseline human as opposed to the variant. True. Or, uh, and I have done this before with one of my humans, when I rolled up my stats, I rolled up six odd numbered <laughs> stats. And they were all pretty decent. Like right. the lowest was an 11, uh -huh, uh -huh. right? And I'm sitting there looking, I was like, why don't I want an why 18 and two 16s and a 14 right. and two 12s? You start looking at that. Yeah, you start looking at it, it's like, I could bump all these up to another modifier. Right. Now, what is more important, bumping all six of your base abilities up by one mm -hmm. or that one feat? In that case, you're just delaying when you're taking that feat. You could get it at first level, mm -hmm. but by raising all your ability scores by one, you're, you're ensuring that you don't need as many of those ability score increases later on. And right. so I kind of see in, uh, in that respect balancing them out for certain classes. Now, there are some feat-hungry builds where you want that extra feat. Yeah, you need it. Some fighter builds have that, where it's like you're going to want great weapon master and polearm and Sentinel, and you know that that kind of build, uh, you you want as many feats as, as quickly as possible, yeah. and you might be willing to sacrifice your raw stats 
mm -hmm. uh, in order to get the special abilities that you want to come together and a thing. So there, yeah. I, I I don't think that I, it, well it, at times if you if you're reading online, variant human seems to be baseline default human. Yeah, it's it like it really. That's why I phrased the question like that <laughs> slightly sarcastically. Right. Like, why aren't you already doing this? Why aren't yeah. you already doing it? And so I I think it's worthwhile. I it, it, it's one of those things, and not just with with humans, but in Dungeons and Dragons and role playing in general. Whenever I start thinking that one option is something I will never choose and I will always choose the other one. That triggers in my mind a, <clears throat> a, a reaction where I go, wait a second, what's going on? Why am I not considering that other one right. an option? Yeah. And is there a case in which I would consider it an option? Yeah. And trying to think of ways in which, you know, I'm okay, I previously ruled this one out. I felt that same way about sorcerers very recently. Right. Where I was like, I would never play a sorcerer. Why in the world would I play a sorcerer? I'm right. a wizard guy. And then it, it, it made me go, wait a second, what are the, where are the conditions under which I would play a sorcerer? Yeah. And really kind of discovered, like, yeah, there's a lot of... Well, and to piggyback that on that, I was gonna I was gonna make a point about uh, the the variant human. Uh, maybe that feat is you want to play a focus spellcaster and you want to deal one type of elemental damage. Right. You're gonna want to get that uh, what is it elemental uh, elemental mastery, mastery or, or, or affinity or whatever yeah. it is. You want to get that where you can bypass people's resistance with your one like you want to be the fire bender. You right. want to be the flame blaster. You know whatever that yeah, you, yeah. however you refer to it. Yeah. But first level. Okay, yeah, I don't care about your it. resistance, guys. Yeah. I'm going to burn through it. Like I said, it, to me it comes down to, do you have a feet-hungry build, or do you have a, a, a one that we're going to rely a lot on stats? Now, obviously, there are some drawbacks to choosing human. No dark vision is kind of the big one. Yeah, that's, right? that's the big one. Um, and so there might be some classes that uh, human doesn't work as well as for. I'm thinking like rogues or rangers, those who want to sneak around a lot in dark environments. Mm -hmm. Having dark vision makes it that much easier to sneak. Kind of hard to sneak around if you're carrying a light source in a dark underground uh, environment. But that's why you might want to grab Skulker. You might want to grab Skulker, or you might want to consider a two-level dip into Warlock if it's that important to you, or you mm -hmm. might want to just, uh, you know, ask a party member to uh, to pick up the Dark Vision spell and, and cast on you. We need yeah, it. Yeah, help, help a human out. Come right, on. there are ways around it. It's not uh, that big of a but limitation. But that aside, there's a plenty of people in the real world that but, sneak around but in the that's, dark. That's my thing with Dark Vision and Dungeons and & Dragons, period, is like, it's not like nighttime combat is unheard of in yeah. pre-modern <laughs> you know history it's yeah. it's difficult it's it's a risky endeavor and mm. there is a reason that night battles were rare but at the same time in the kind of not like the big set piece 50,000 men on one side and 50,000 on the other get together and clash over a period of 8 hours but in the small scale conflicts that happen in a lot of pre-modern wars the skirmishes two scouting parties coming across one another and fighting like that kind of thing trying to sneak into a castle trying to sneak into a fortified town those are the kinds of things which do take place under cover of darkness and obviously not having dark vision hasn't been that much of a hindrance towards people getting around and doing things at night. It yeah. is difficult, uh, but not impossible. And so reading the entry in the player's handbook, it's like, okay, they're sort of this kind of, ver there's a variety of humans. They're described as sort of colonizers and conquerors and migrants. And Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition has done a really, really interesting thing and I think a really positive thing in which it said, yes, that humans come in a wide variety of colors, shapes, sizes, and textures, and there's art to back that up. And that's different from previous editions of the game where it's very much, you know, it's just a bunch of like, honestly, a bunch of white people who are there. <laughs> and that's exclusionary to the fan base, which is, uh, you know, very Yeah, it, uh, Yeah, in past editions, it kind of always has felt that most most human cultures are just kind of we like Western European. Western European, right. Yeah. And so there's a, there's this rich history and, and tradition from other regions of the world that we can draw on for our Dungeons and Dragons games. You be respectful, you want to be conscientious of what you're doing, but it's there as, as something that you can use as inspiration. And so I, I like the fact that the human entry in the player's handbook calls that out and says, hey, we're making an effort to be mm -hmm. inclusive and diverse because we recognize that our fan base is, is inclusive and diverse and, yeah. and trying to uh, make the rules match what people are playing. Generally, in the games that I have played in, and you can speak to your experience, humans do have kind of a dominant culture in the, right. in any setting I've normally played in, right? right. Yeah. They are kind of one of the powerhouses. Yes. What are some different ways to look at that? Part of the reason is is it's an inheritance from the literature that Dungeons and Dragons draws on for its inspiration. And it's the human-centric literature, whether it's the sort of sword and sorcery literature of the 20s and 30s, or uh, you know Middle Earth and its derivatives uh, in, moving from the 70s onwards. Like humans seem to be the 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 central focus of most of this mm -hmm. literature, and therefore Dungeons and Dragons then becomes humans are the 
central race, the central touchstone for everyone in, in the original uh, editions of the game. Yeah. They're the ones that can be the most classes. They have no level limits on them. Right. right? And other classes are literally demi-humans. They are less than less, human. Yeah. They have level caps. And so like, even like elves, the majestic, magic suffused, they have a cap on how like humans will be better wizards than an elf. How does, right. that, how does that happen? It Jim? just does. That's the way that because the elf gets a bunch of bonuses at, at, at first level that uh -huh. the humans don't get, and so so the elf is eventually at some point going to go. Oh, I'm tired of this. I'm tired of this, or, or do something else. Uh, I think that there was a purpose and a, and a place for those kind of level limits in old school Dungeons and Dragons. In in newer versions of the game, I, I think you know those level limits are rightly gotten rid of, and right. we can now just play whatever we want. But Coming back to what you're talking about, the dominant human, I think that's the legacy of it. The, yeah. the fact that there are so many human kingdoms and yeah. human monarchies and empires and republics and what have you. That's where you're seeing that legacy and they're trying to then justify it by saying, well, they're migrants. They're, they're moving all over the place. They inhabit every corner of these worlds. Um, they're conquerors and colonizers. They mm -hmm. seep into the world and, and create these lasting institutions whereas an elf or a dwarf might live for hundreds of years and personally be invested in a place a, a human founds an organization or a or a temple or a or something a, a government type and it endures for yeah. generations because and of their short-lived lives because of their short-lived lives and the fact that there's so many of them they're able to imbue these institutions mm -hmm. with uh, longevity in that respect and mm -hmm. and that's why you don't have a situation where elves control everything or dwarves control everything something like that I think that's an interesting take on it. it. It certainly has implications if you think about it. Like, why are the other why are why are the other races not resentful of humanity well, for their I mean, omnipresence? Well, some of them are, though. I mean, yeah. that's it's certainly played that way. I think that you can play it that way. I think the Witcher setting does a really good job of of showing what happens with a human centric world where they use that and and the power that would come from humanity controlling everything. And the fact that they put dwarves and, and halflings and elves into ghettos and institute pogroms against them um, because of that. It's a dark world, uh, the Witcher world is, but it's also one of those that I think takes seriously the power dynamics between the different races. And so I think that like looking at that baseline uh, humanity as presented in the player's handbook of adaptability, creating these uh, long-lasting institutions of a diverse race that's found in every corner of the globe, that, that that's kind of an easy thing to think of, right? Yeah. That's an easy touchstone for new players of the game yeah. or for people who just, uh, you know, they don't want to have to, it, you know, playing a Dragonborn or a Tiefling is just too alien for them. This is a game, it's supposed to be some uh, fantastical reflection of our own world and history, so mm. it's easy for us to think about human empires spanning continents and, you know, because, hey, that happened, right? Right. You know, oh, you know, humans moving into areas and taking others' <laughs> land. Oh, because that happened, right? Right. right. Our um, ancestors were murder hobos is what I'm saying. Um, well, yeah, I mean, that's absolutely true. There's, <laughs> there are a lot of, there's a lot of murder hoboism in, uh, in our own history. Um, and, I, and I think that <laughs> what we can draw from our own history is it, we can inform our Dungeons and Dragons settings with that history. Yeah. And you don't have to have you don't have to have taken a bunch of courses in it. You don't have to take a bunch of books. You can just pull up a Wikipedia article yeah. and, and go with that uh, with the understanding that what's one person's ancient history is another person's very personal identity. And so yes. you just got to be careful with those kinds of things. Looking at humanity in your Dungeons and Dragons setting and going like, how can I make changes to the baseline assumption to create something unique and different? So like for my own, my own homebrew setting, humanity shares power with the other two dominant races in the world, the dwarves and goblin kind, yeah. and sort of a triumvirate of power in which the different uh, representatives of those peoples have divided up the responsibility of, of, of keeping this continent-wide uh, empire going. Yeah. Whether it's the military might of the goblinoids, the administrative capacity and, and, and trade links that the dwarves have, or just the personal charisma and, and ruling ability of the humans, um, that that's kind of this you know trifecta of power that controls this continent-wide empire. But other places you might say like, well, maybe humanity isn't the dominant force. Yeah. Right? Like maybe humanity is, uh, they're the scrappy newcomers on the scene, you know, mm -hmm. newly created by the gods who are new themselves, right? Like the hu human gods are, are as new as humanity itself. And, yeah. you know, you'd want to find where they came from, how they came about. Maybe they languish in obscurity in some corner of the world that you 
you've never really fully explored and come exploding out of it. Yeah, they're <laughs> on the island just off the coast mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. all start making landfall. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's a concept in history known as a uh, the, these places in our own world called wo the, they call them the womb of nations. Yes. Central Asia is one of those. Scandinavia is one of those. And in our own history, they they tend to just like erupt in pressure, whether it's the Huns and Mongols and other steppe peoples or Germanic barbarian tribes who, yeah. who migrate out of Scandinavia and, and you know, have seem to have done well for themselves over the centuries, um, <laughs> that you can try draw that into your own Dungeons and Dragons world and say, yeah, there's this place on the map where there's just a bunch of barbarians that live. They just tents made of animal skins and, mm -hmm. and <laughs> they eat weird stuff. And yeah. maybe it's the sophisticated, highly refined cultural, uh, you know, cultural, uh, you know, supremacy of the elves and dwarves who looks at these just gross, like, God, and they breed like rabbits and yeah. they're just like and, and you know you can draw these gone like, in the blink of an eye gone in the blink of an eye you can't even you can hardly learn their name before one of them dies <laughs> and that 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 those sort of like explode out of the particular region in your dungeons and dragons world and you deal with the implications that are present in the player's handbook of the humans being conquerors and migrants and colonizers and deal with that in game and like yeah we've got a real human problem on our hands in this elven kingdom they came out of nowhere and there are thousands of them yeah they're getting a little upset and and things could get uh you know there something could set this fuse off and now yeah. you've got a real problem they're coming into your forest chopping all your trees down because they want to make homes right hunting all the game like, why don't they just grow the trees into their home well they only live for 50 well, they only years. live for 50 years and the tree doesn't yeah, yeah. so I, I think that there's uh there's potential there was sort of like the scrappy newcomer creating conflict and tension mm -hmm. with more established races. Yeah. There's using humanity as kind of uh, uh, an, an, uh, the oppressed masses of humanity or even going full on like humans are enslaved. Like there's yeah. all of these races that are much more powerful than humanity, live longer. Yeah. Um, and different ways that you can take that, right? Well, yeah. The uh, Like in that same scenario, what if the elves like saw this at the beginning and were like, you know what, we need to do something about this before it gets out of hand, swoop in with their high magic enslave mm -hmm. all the humans to right. do their bidding and keep them in check. Right. I've done something like that in, in other games where it's like the the elves, I, and for me it's one of those things where I, think, I really look at the elves and I go, I have to come up with a reason for why they don't control everything based on how long they live. Right. Right. The accumulation of wealth and power that comes from having lived so long would, I see, grant them a kind of authority and, and uh, power that uh, that I don't find present in D&D worlds and I'm not always satisfied by by the let's all just get along and fight the evil races kind of thing that sometimes goes on. Mm -hmm. So I, I envision a world in which the elves are like, yeah, uh, you know, humans live in this little village, there's a cluster of villages and everyone knows that the wandering elf helps us. Yeah. That the wandering elf helped my grandfather and his grandfather before him and before him and before him as far back as anyone can ever remember in their yeah. written record this one elf yeah. comes and helps us. And yeah, we send a quarter of our grain to the castle where he may or may not live. But what they don't realize is that that elf has experienced, has watched these villagers grow from generation to generation. And yeah, like they aren't even aware of their enslavement. They aren't even aware yeah. that the other races sort of control things. Um, there's a variant of that where you can do like sort of the monsters have won Mm. Kind of thing where the humanity is on the verge of extinction, or yeah. or something. Um, just anything that uh, that that kind of takes the assumptions of the the player's handbook, human, and sort of tweaks it just a little bit. Maybe mm -hmm. they're not the dominant ones. Maybe there's still a lot of them, but but they haven't leveraged those numbers into real power. Well, I love the the humans on the verge of extinction. Like you know, because at that point, like if you are to have a human in the party, they might be the only human. Right. <laughs> and maybe like elves and dwarves are like, we haven't seen any of y'all in a century. Yeah, yeah. Which, how the hell are you alive? Right, what are you doing? Yeah, maybe the humans have disappeared or, or were driven to near extinction and you're like, yeah, I'm the last human. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or I'm, or yeah. Once again, like that. You can, I, I would play, I would play my character like Sean Connery. <laughs> <laughs> I am the last I'm one. the last one. Oh, I just <laughs> beaten that one to death. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I, I want humans in my game. They're yeah. a popular race. I'm going to have players who want to play humans. I've, I don't think I've ever run a campaign where someone didn't play a human. Right. <laughs> and I can't. 
I, I, I really think, don't know. I'd have know. to actually think for a while. Right. Thinking about your play, the human's place in your campaign world and coming up with different ways or different takes on it is going to just add something different and, yeah. and present something different to people. And you don't have to go with the default like, oh, there's like eight human kingdoms and they all have, they're all variations of the same. Mm -hmm. But I only got the one dwarf. Uh, you know, maybe you switch that, uh, switch that around, yeah. and try something uh, different with your game. What's the one? The guy that does the, the movie reviews. There's an alien. He pretends to be an alien. Oh, uh, un uh, Earthling, Cinema. Earthling Cinema. Earthling Cinema. I'm, I'm Garrix Wormuloid. Yeah. And today on that guy needs to get out of the house a little more. Work into that premise. That's well, like the most premise-heavy YouTube channel I think. I've let me ever tell you though, if you watch seen. it from the beginning, it's so worth it because once you learn all the little things, like not showing food, not showing eating, because that's like porno, and everything's a horse if it has four legs. Like start learning the verbiage of that, yeah. of how they interpret humanity. Yeah, because that's the thing. They've done they, a really clever thing. There's like, continuity there that they yeah. stick to. Yeah, and yeah. and so I that's what I love about it. It is fucking funny, and and the fact that it's always Chris. Chris Nolan's brother. Yeah. Like anytime it's anything to do with Christopher Nolan, it's his brother that they refer to. Just because, you know, you would get those facts wrong. Humans. <clears throat> Hello, fellow human. I'm Human Pruitt, and this is Human Jim. And today on WebDM, human music. <laughs> 